All right, how's everybody doing? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Tuesday, April 27th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing all right today. So I wanted to do a... Um, preview of a online course that I teach that's starting up Saturday, uh, May 1st, 2021, called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So a lot of you all know, a lot of you have heard me talk about this uh, online class on my radio show. And we deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. So I'm going to do a um, preview right now of uh, the content of um, of the online course. All right. And we'll give you the information so you can register for it also. All right. So everybody share this broadcast on your uh, social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. So this is a nine week, 18 hour online course that I teach. And we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. OK, so I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have uh, book references, articles, uh, video clips. And this time around uh, is going to meet on Saturdays, Saturdays uh, starting May 1st, 2021, uh, 12 noon to um 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, okay? Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So this is a preview of this online course. So I want to bring up the uh, PowerPoint presentation here. And I just finished teaching a, uh, I just finished teaching the class. Uh, we did it on Tuesdays, and it started in February for African American History Month, okay? Uh, and this one here that starts up Saturday, May 1st, um, this is going to be revised. We're going to have some additional information uh, in this class. OK. All right. So this is um, a preview of ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And this class started as a four hour lecture, four and a half hour lecture I did back in 2014. And it has evolved into a uh, online class, all right? Uh, if you visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, you'll see the flyer here. And um, you can register there for the online course also. All right, let's continue. So here's some things that we deal with in the, uh, in the class. Now, this is, this is a really important time, I think, to have this discussion and, and do this online class. And around February of each year, you'll oftentimes hear about what I call, um, you know, Black History Month lessons gone wrong or slave lessons gone wrong, things like this, right? And oftentimes when you have things like uh, mock slave reenactments, uh, in class, um, all these different types of um, exercises and, and teaching lessons that they'll have in different schools. It can be traumatizing uh, for students, okay? But th there's an article from USA Today that came out uh, March 2nd, 2021, March 2nd, 2021 from USA Today. And it's called Mock Slave Auctions, Racist Lessons, How U.S. History Class Often Traumatizes, Dehumanizes Black Students. OK, we're going to take a look at this quickly because this this ties into why the online class is so important. And this ties into oftentimes misinformation that we get in school or that our children, uh, our children get in school as well dealing with our history, okay? Um, so this is from uh, March 2nd, 2021, Mock Slave Auctions, 
racist lessons, how U.S. history class often traumatizes, dehumanizes students. We're just going to look at this briefly here. So it starts out talking about a um, in Missis in a Mississippi middle school, an official at a Mississippi middle school apologized uh, after eighth graders were asked to pretend they were enslaved people, including writing letters discussing their journey to America and the family they live with, work with, okay? During Black History Month in uh, Florida, a high school teacher in Florida was suspended with pay after allegedly telling students slaves were not whipped by white people and that the N-word, a rate which is a racist slur, just means ignorant. Uh, then you had uh, this uh, incident in Tennessee in February 2020, where you had a teacher in the fourth grade. Um, the, the teacher was teaching fourth grade students and they assigned, uh, they used the Willie Lynch letter 1712, and Willie Lynch never historically existed. They used the Willie Lynch letter 1712 to teach about keeping blacks, uh, black slaves under control. Willie, it's been, the Willie Lynch letter has been proven to be a fraud. Willie Lynch never historically existed. Uh, so you, you, this article deals with all these different crazy incidents. And I have a numerous articles over the past few years to talk about things like this. And one of the things this article deals with is a study from the Southern Poverty Law Center called Teaching Hard History, American Slavery teaching hard history, American slavery. And I use this study. Uh, this is one of the sources uh, that I use in, in the online course that I teach, teaching hard history, American slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. We'll talk about that a little bit in just a minute. But what the uh, what this article, one of the things it says is such careless assignments and lessons can traumatize students, experts said, and they are just one example of how teachers in the U.S. have long struggled and failed to teach the complex history of slavery. How, how uh, teachers in the U.S. have long struggled to teach the complex history of slavery, all right? Now, uh, Keferlin Brown, who's a professor of cultural studies and education at the University of Texas, Austin, and Keferlin, Keferlin Brown is also, um, uh, talked about in the online course, I mean, in the uh, in the, in the uh, study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. She said, unfortunately, slavery is addressed often in ways that are either marginalizing or it's the only way that black people are brought into the curriculum. It's either marginalizing or the only way black people are brought into the curriculum. OK. Um, all right. So read the rest of this article here. They talk about some examples of African-American students being traumatized by slave lessons gone wrong, Black History Month uh, lessons gone wrong. So I want to go back to the slide. How's everybody doing? Everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. And uh, we'll post a link again uh, so you can register for the online course. Uh, I want to go back to the PowerPoint presentation again. So. Um, at the at the very same time, you know, we have a number of different things taking place. We have an attack on African American history and African history. We have um, some Republican states that are trying to control in the state legislature what can be taught regarding um, history, what can be taught regarding slavery, social justice, things like this. Uh, there was an article from USA Today, Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project. So the 1619 Project from the New York Times. Now, you've heard me talk about the 1619 Project before. The 1619 Project does have some flaws in it. It's much better than the uh, 1776 Project. OK, it's much better than the 1776 Project, the uh, commission that uh, Donald Trump. Uh, commissioned, and then they put out the uh, 1619, they put out the 1776 uh, uh, report at whitehouse.gov. Luckily, Joe Biden took that nonsense down. Okay. But you, you have uh, this fight taking place in the state legislatures attacking 
um, African American history, African history. If we look at this article here from uh, USA Today and also uh, news1.com has one that's similar. Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 project. Okay, so it talks about how uh, lawmakers in several state houses this year in 2021 want to stop lesson plans that focus on the centrality of slavery to American history as presented in the New York Times 1619 project previewing new battles in states over control of civics education, okay? Previewing new battles in states over control of civics education. Republican lawmakers in Arkansas, Iowa, uh, Mississippi, Missouri, and South Dakota filed bills in January of 2021. If, in, if enacted, these bills would cut funding to K through 12 schools and colleges that provide lessons derived from the award-winning project known as the 1619 Project. Uh, the South Dakota bill has since been withdrawn. Now, some historians say the bills are part of a larger effort by Republicans, including former President Donald Trump, to glorify and a, to glorify a more white and patriarchal view of American history that downplays the ugly legacy of slavery and the contributions of African-Americans, Native Americans, women, and others to the nation's founding. Okay, so this is, this, this is what's taking place, all right? You, and there's a, a concerted effort, especially uh, surrounding the 400th year anniversary of 1619, and then we see a greater push and even an even greater push now and more momentum behind reparations. Um, we see a concerted effort to try to suppress uh, teaching this history in school. OK, so this is what's taking place. And we see Republicans attacking us at the state legislature level. We saw Donald Trump attacking us at the federal level from the White House with the 1776 project for, for, for uh, just one example, the 1776 project. All right, I want to go back to the uh, PowerPoint presentation here. Okay, so here's the cover of the study I was talking about, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery, Teaching Hard History of American Slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I found out about this study um, there was a article from uh, theatlantic.com, okay? This is from, uh, I think it was 2018 um, or 2019, but it's called What Kids Are Really Learning About Slavery? What Kids Are Really Learning About Slavery? Uh, a new report uh, finds that the topic is often uh, sentimentalized is often mistaught and often sentimentalized and students are alarmingly misinformed as a result. Students are alarmingly misinformed as a result. Okay. Now, the reason why this type of information is so important is because the, um, what you understand about a people, OK, what, what the way you treat a people is largely based upon how you think about the, how you think about a people, how you think about a people is largely based upon what you've been taught about the people. What you've been taught about a group of people is largely based upon what you've read, seen and heard about the people. OK, and how people understand history influences the policies they support, the laws they support, who they elect into office, et cetera. This has wide ranging impact. What happens when people are operating based upon a lie, when they think that um, the Confederacy was something that was good? OK, when they think the when they when, when, when they embrace the Confederate battle flags or the Confederate flags of the Confederacy. And these were traitors to the Union. OK, what happens when they have monuments erected to the Confederacy? And these were people who, who took up arms to maintain slavery. 
and they were trying to overthrow the government. All right. I'm not talking about January 6th overthrow the government. I'm talking about back during the Civil War. OK, January 6th. Yeah, that was an insurrection. They're operating based upon misinformation as well. So if we uh, look at this here now, this this statue is uh, a statue that was erected in 1876. It's called the Lincoln Emancipation Statue. It was paid for by former enslaved um, Africans, and it was erected in Washington, D.C. in 1876. And the statue has been criticized for representing the history of slavery from a paternalistic uh, perspective. But very quickly here, if we look at uh, some information that is in the uh, study. So the study was a, uh, they did two things, two main things. They did a online survey of 1,000 high school seniors, an online survey of 1,000 high school seniors to find out what they uh, knew about slavery and the history of slavery, okay? And then they also uh, did a survey of about 1,700 uh, social studies teachers as well. But a new report released by the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Tolerance Project points to the widespread failure to accurately teach the hard and nuanced history of American slavery and enslaved people, okay? Uh, the the uh, nuanced history of American slavery and enslaved people. Collectively, the report finds that slavery is mistaught, mischaracterized, sanitized, and sentimentalized, leaving students poorly educated and contemporary uh, 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 poorly educated and contemporary issues of race and racism misunderstood. Now, in what it describes as the first analysis of its kind, Teaching Tolerance conducted online surveys of 1,000 American high school seniors and more than 1,700 social studies teachers across the country. The group also reviewed 10 commonly used uh, U.S. history textbooks, and it examined uh, 15 sets of state standards to assess what students know, what educators teach, and what publishers include, and what standards require, uh, what standards are required vis-a-vis -vis slavery. And here's, here are some of their findings. Their findings are, are pretty disturbing. Uh, among 12th graders, they found that only 8% of 12th graders surveyed uh, could identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War being fought. Only 8% of 12th graders surveyed could identify slavery as the central cause of the uh, Civil War being fought. Okay. Now, fewer than one third or 32% correctly named the uh, 13th Amendment. 13th Amendment of 1865 as the formal uh, end to U.S. slavery, with a slightly higher share of 35 percent choosing the Emancipation Proclamation. So the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, but the Emancipation Proclamation did not uh, free the slaves, did not free the enslaved Africans. It's going to be the 13th Amendment of 1865 that's going to free the slaves. So when you when you go through and look at this study, you, you start to realize just how little high school seniors know about the history of slavery. And it probably also means their parents did not teach them either. Because it probably means the parents don't know the correct information also. Now um Fewer than half or 46 percent identified the Middle Passage as the transport of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean to North America. You can read this full article. Uh, this is from 2018, February 1st, 2018. This, this was the beginning of African-American History Month. What kids are really learning about slavery? What kids are really learning about slavery? Um, and this deals with a study from the Southern Poverty Law Center called Teaching Hard History American Slavery. Now, when we go through, and I and I read, you know, 
a number of different, I've read a number of different studies over the years that talk about the benefits of our children learning their history and the uh, children and teenagers grew up to be adults as well. Uh, there was a study a few years ago that talked about um, the positive feelings about blackness uh, improve the academic performance of black girls. New studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance for black girls. This was an article from uh, the root.com. It talked about this study conducted by Professor Ch Sharita Butler Barnes at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Believing that black is beautiful, belie believing that black is beautiful, an important mantra of self-acceptance and self-love could pay major dividends in school. Uh, an article in the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education uh, focuses on focuses on a new study from uh, Professor Sharita Butler Barnes at Washington University in St. Louis, which finds that young black women with strong racial identity, young black women with strong racial identity are more likely to be academically engaged, cu curious, and persistent. More likely to be academically engaged, curious, and persistent. The survey looked at 733 African-American middle and high school girls in three socioeconomically uh, school districts, socioeconomic school districts, according to the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education. Now, the study is called Promoting Resilience Among African-American Girls, Racial Identity as a Protective Factor. And it was published on the uh, Child Development Journal website and this study found that feeling positive about being black, along with feeling supported by their schools, correlated with the girls' greater academic mo motivation. OK, feeling supported, uh, being feeling positive about being black. Along with feeling supported by their schools, correlated with the girls' greater academic motivation. Researchers also found that feeling good about your racial identity could act as a buffer for students in hostile or negative academic environments. OK, um, so check out uh, check out this article from the root dot com. New studies find that positive feelings about blackness improve academic performance uh, for black girls. They went on to say persons of color who have an unhealthy racial identity uh, persons of color who have unhealthy racial identity beliefs tend to perform lower in school and have more symptoms of depression. We found that feeling positive about, about being black and feeling support and belonging at school may be especially important for African-American girls, classroom engagement and curiosity. Feeling connected to the school may also work together with racial identity attitudes to improve academic outcomes. All right, so um, if we look at some of the things that we cover in this nine-week online course that I teach called uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, once again, it's a PowerPoint presentation. These are some of the slides. Well, you're going to see some of the slides I use in the class. We have book references, articles. There's about 50 articles. That I reference. It's going to be about 60 now because I'm going to reference some new archaeological discoveries that had just happened in like the last month or so. But we deal with things like what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? Because I try to um, deal, with, deal with all these historical events, try to deal with it uh, chronologically and take you throughout history. OK, deal with thousands of years of history and take you to what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place so we can understand cause and effect. Uh, what were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play? play? Columbus is crucial, uh, essential to the spread of slavery. OK, Columbus and uh, his four voyages starting August 3rd, 1492, when he set sail on the Nina Nepenthe and the Santa Maria. 
We know the lands that Columbus is conquering, like uh, Haiti and Puerto Rico and Honduras and Panama, the Bahamas. They're setting up plantations. He's conquering on behalf of the Spanish crown. They're setting up plantations. Uh, they are um, enslaving the uh, native people, uh, decimating the population of native, pe native people, extracting gold and silver and different things like this, mineral wealth from the uh, uh, various lands that they're conquering and setting up plantations, especially sugarcane plantations. Okay, so Columbus is crucial for the um, spread of, of racism and slavery and capitalism and the exploitation of indigenous people. Uh, so we deal with uh, Christopher Columbus and what led up to Columbus setting sail uh, also in 1492. And that gets into the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. When did Africans first come to the U.S. Uh, as slaves? OK, uh, as enslaved Africans, did Africans sell themselves into slavery? Uh, when uh, were African people in America before the transatlantic slave trade, which is extremely important and one of the one of the problems is that oftentimes when we deal with this history, we, we we start like sometimes people think they're starting at the beginning. They're starting like the mid fourteenth, the mid fifteenth century, and they start like at what they think is the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. So they're starting fourteen forty one with the Portuguese going into what today is Mauritania. Um. But you have to understand hundreds of years of history that leads up to this taking place. OK, and the, the Europeans were uh, dealing with the African Moors and fighting against the Moors for hundreds of years leading up to 1441. They didn't just that the mid 15th century was not when Europeans first came in contact with African people. No, the, the Moors. Had going to. The Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal in 711 AD. They're taking teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe. These teachings are going to bring the Europeans out of the Dark Ages and it's going to save Europe. And it's going to save Europe to our detriment. Because everything that we taught the Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. Um, and one of the Sources I use in the class is uh, the book by Dr. David M. Hotep, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Um, he's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him a number of times. The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. Because what a lot of people don't know, and this is one of the problems with the whole 1619 story, when people think that African people first came to this land, August 20th, 1619, even though August 20th, 1619 did happen. And we just talked about that on on um, a, show, um, a show a couple of days ago. Even though 1619 did happen, and it's important to understand that history, African people were in this land we call the United States of America going back tens of thousands of years ago. Okay, these were the Khoisan, and the Khoisan come from Southern Africa and have the oldest DNA on the planet. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. And they go all around the world, and they they come to they come to this land. OK, we, we did not first come here conquered by Europeans shackled in chains. And this is one of the problems with the way the history is taught. We, we teach our children that we first came to this land conquered by Europeans and shackled in chains. Even though the transatlantic slave trade did happen, I'm not saying it did not happen. I'm saying we have to understand like 50,000 years before it happened and understand that history. OK, so. Uh, we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. And, uh, you know, these archaeological uh, these archaeological discoveries are taking place like every every week, every other week. Um, if you read National Geographic, Washington Post, New York Times. Um, they they all have articles dealing with all these shocking archaeological discoveries um we look at there was a lost city uh, a lost city in egypt that was just uh discovered that dates back 
uh, about um, 3,000 years ago, okay, the lost city of Egypt. And we, we, we talked about that on, on my radio show. Um, it's uh, it, actually this article right here from N NBC News talks about it. You can find some of these articles in like mainstream media uh, sources. They'll, they'll talk about these archaeological discoveries. Um, if we look at this, if we flip over here and look at this article right quick. Inside Egypt's 3,000 years old lost golden city. Inside Egypt's 3,000 year old lost golden city. Um, this article is from April 10th, 2021. A lost golden city in Egypt dating back 3,400 years has been revealed in what is being called the most uh, important discovery in the country since the tomb of uh, King Tut Ankhamen in 1922. The city buried under sands near the modern city of Luxor for three millennia was uncovered in September 2020 by a team led by Egyptian archaeologist Zahi Hawass and was revealed to the world Thursday. OK. Quote, this is a, uh, this is amazing because actually we know uh, a lot about tombs. And afterlife. Uh, but now we discover a large city to tell us for the first time about the life of the people during the golden age. So these, these archeological discoveries are taking place all the time. And what's happening is when you, when you read about these discoveries, they tell you oftentimes this is causing us to have to rethink everything. They have to keep pushing the timelines back. Okay. Uh, you know, juvenile had a song back in, like 1998, 99, back that thing up. When when these archaeological discoveries take place, they keep having to back the timelines up. They keep having to back that thing up, because when you read this, when you read the uh, articles, they'll tell you that look, we it, this is causing us to rethink everything, and this is causing us to realize that all this stuff is much older than we thought. So. We'll deal with shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. Insurance companies that uh, took out insurance policies on uh, not just slave ships, okay, but also enslaved Africans on the plantations as well. Okay, they took out insurance policies on enslaved Africans on the plantations also. Um, we'll deal with Freemasonry. America and the uh, founding fathers. All right, because the foundation of Freemasonry are the teachings coming out of ancient Kim and ancient Egypt, like the lodges uh, out of uh, ancient Kim. All right. And this is going to form the foundation of the teachings of Freemasonry. Um, we deal with the origins of the term America, Africa and, and others as well. The problem with slave movies while we've been bombarded, especially a few years ago, may not be as much in like 2020, 2021, but especially a few years ago, there's a proliferation of slave movies, uh, movies dealing with slavery. Um, we do it with Osara, Osset, and Heru, or who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and the origins of the Immaculate Conception story. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, one of my teachers, Professor Kaba Hiawatha, the common name. Uh, says to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. So when we deal with the Helios Biblos or the Holy Bible, and when you look at, when you study the etymology of the word Helios Biblos, it take, it, it, when you study the etymology of the word Holy Bible, it takes you back to Helios, Helios Biblos, which is Greek, which means sun book, S-U-N, the sun book. Okay. And this ties into astronomy. This ties into and uh, ancient African mythology and ancient African spiritual systems, all of this. But um, we're going to see the uh, Immaculate Conception stories, a story thousands of years old coming out of ancient Kemet, out of ancient Egypt. 
Uh, we see links to ancient Kemet uh, and early Christianity, Freemasonry in America. We talk about the fake Willie Lynch letter, 1712 also. It's like I said, Willie Lynch never historically existed. Okay. This is Renoko Rashidi as well. Been a view Renoko a number of times. Um, this is, uh, and Renoko is brilliant. Uh, I used one of his books in my class uh, dealing with the um, Black Star, the African presence in early Europe. Black Star, the African presence in early Europe. I use that in the class. Where's that book? Hold on, Black Star. This is now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. This is African People and European Holidays and Mental Genocide by Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class, but I use these for reference. Some books people may have at home on their shelves. Um, yeah, Black Star, uh, The African Presence in Early Europe by Renoko Rashidi. Also, this, this deals a lot with the history of the Moors. Also, um, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. It's another book we use in the class, okay? Uh, these are deep, deep books. All right, now, this is um, Dr. David M. Hotel. Been interviewed him a number of times. He's a friend of mine. He wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. His new book should be out very soon uh he's trying to get the footnotes done i just talked to him two weeks ago um this is the book here his this book deals with this book deals with the african presence in the americas in south america going back at least fifty six thousand years ago uh and in this land we call the united states of america going back at least fifty one thousand seven hundred years ago okay uh, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence. So his book is backed up by 713 footnotes that, that thoroughly document an African presence in um, North, Central, and South America. If we look at this here, page 14 of his book, page 14 of his book deals with the discovery that came out of um, uh, South Carolina, okay, Allendale County, South Carolina, in uh, 2004. Allendale County, South Carolina, in 2004. All right. On page 14 of his book, they talk about this um, evidence of an African presence that dates back at least 51,700 years ago, okay. And this discovery was made by Dr. Albert Goodyear. Dr. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. And they, he discovered, uh, he and his archaeological team, they discovered 13 types of evidence that document an African presence in South Carolina dating back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M17D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in South Carolina dating back at least 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. Uh, even the Genome Project documented the Khoisan as having the oldest DNA on the planet. And they come from Southern Africa. They spoke in cliques, uh, the click language. And they go all around the world. Okay, these are the short stature people, the short stature Africans. 
Now, this is an article from ScienceDaily.com. ScienceDaily.com is a scientific website. They have scientific discoveries there. This is an article from November 8th, 2004. November 8th, 2004. This is 17 years ago. The name of this article is New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. Now, you can go read this article. See, you don't have to believe a word that I say. Proper documentation ends all conversation. You don't have to believe a word that I say, okay? You, I, I give you these sources. You can research this for yourself. You don't have to believe me. When you read this article, this is a summary of what the article says. This is not my summary. This is the summary from ScienceDaily.com. Now, this is a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. Dr. Albert Goodyear is a white man. And in the in the online online class, I'm going to deal with a number of different archaeological discoveries that have happened over the past few years that is just totally mind blowing. And show how all this stuff is much older than what we've been taught. This is why, you know, the whole this whole thing with 1619, you know, is 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 it did happen. In, in Virginia, that did happen, those 20 and odd Africans on the white lion English pirate ship, because it wasn't even a slave ship. That was a pirate ship. Those Africans were um, originally from uh, Angola, and they were on a Portuguese slave ship called the San Juan Batista. And the San Juan Batista gets um, hijacked by English pirates around Veracruz, Mexico. And uh, about 50 Africans, between 50 to 60 Africans, are put on two English pirate ships called the White Lion and the Treasurer. The White Lion and the Treasurer are going to come into Point Comfort in Virginia. The White Lion comes in first. And there's about 20 and odd Africans on the White Lion English pirate ship that are going to be exchanged for food and water and supplies, you know, August 20th, 1619. Um, but there were Africans in this land tens of thousands of years before that. And the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina and Georgia in 1526. That's 93 years before 1619. So this is why we have to understand the chronology and understand that this was our land stolen from us also. Okay. African people were in this land. We call the United States, United States of America, even before native Americans came into existence. So when we look at this article, it says, the summary says, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina uh, archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicates that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. OK, well, who, who were these humans? 50,000 years ago, that's before Native Americans come into existence. These were African people. And, and when you study African people, you're going to see that you'll see all the different species of African pe people, Australopithecus afarensis, which is Lucy or Dinknesh, dates back about 3.2 million years ago. Um, Homo, erect Homo erectus, Homo habilis, uh, all the different species of humans, you're gonna see African people, all those different species. One thing Dr. David M. Hotep told me is that, he said, when it comes to Native Americans, you won't find remains of Native Americans older than Homo sapiens, than modern man. But for African people, we're gonna, you're going you're gonna to see that we're all those species, okay? Because we, we were in existence then. All right, let's continue here. This is a discovery here. Um, there's a video clip of... Um, interview that Dr. David M. Hotep did with um, WKRP in Cincinnati Channel 5. And 
he talks about the um he talks about this discovery here out of um on the Greek island of Crete. This is an article from the New York Times from February 2010 on Crete new evidence of very ancient mariners on Crete new evidence of very ancient mariners. This is from the New York Times. Here's a here's a synopsis of what this article says about this archaeological discovery. Um, it talks about how stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete over the course of two summers, archaeologists say are at least 130,000 years old, at least 130,000 years old, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Now, Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, meaning that tool makers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeology say. So they're saying, wait a second. We thought that seafaring in the Mediterranean only dated back about 12,000 years or so. Okay. Okay. So this seems, but, but, but this discovery seems to push back seafaring in the Mediterranean 100,000 years ago. Previous artifact discoveries has shown people reaching Cyprus, a few other Greek islands, and possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10,000, 12,000 years ago. They're saying, wait a second, we had to back that thing up. They're saying, hold on. People were involved in seafaring 100,000 years ago. We're going to have to push the timelines back. We're going to have to rethink this whole thing. Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years. Read this article from the New York Times on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. This, this article is 14 years old. I mean, uh, let's just say 11 years old. This article is 11 years old. So then, so we'll deal with, you know, a number of different archaeological discoveries to try to, because what I have to do, I want to lay a foundation for us to be able to build upon, Okay. We want to lay a historical foundation for us to be able to build upon and go through our history and, and, and see how these archaeological discoveries tie into history and cause us to have to rethink history. This is before we get before we can deal with the transatlantic slave trade. We have to deal with thousands of years of history. OK, there was one discovery. Uh, in Egypt. Back. It may be about. Eight to 10 years ago, they found 17 pyramids buried underneath Egypt. Okay. They found 17 pyramids buried underneath Egypt. And um, we can look at this one here. This is NBC News once again. I have numerous sources, but we'll just look at M NBC News just for. Because uh, it's the one I get my hands on the first. They used a, um, it's a satellite that's something like about 450 miles above Earth or something. It uses uh, infrared technology to see underground. Okay, let's, let's, let's look at this article here. 17 lost pyramids discovered in Egypt by space scientists. 17 lost pyramids are believed to have been found in Egypt by a team of space archaeologists from Alabama, according to a report. I've been to Alabama. I mean, going to Alabama, you may think you're on another planet, but I mean, <laughs> this is from this is from May 25th, 2011. OK, May 25th, 2011. 
17 lost pyramids are believed to have been found in Egypt by a team of space archaeologists from Alabama, according to a report. Sarah Parkak and her team at NASA sponsored laboratory at a, at a NASA, NASA sponsored laboratory at the University of Alabama at Birmingham made the discoveries using a satellite survey and also found more than 1,000 tombs and 3,000 ancient settlements in infrared images that show that show up buildings underground, BBC News reports. The BBC said that two of the suspected pyramids have been confirmed by initial excavation. Now, I remember, I talked about this on my show, when this discovery was, was made. This is 2011. This is 10 years ago. Okay? Uh, but what happens is, is it's a satellite that use infrared technology to see underground, okay? The BBC made a documentary about Sarah Parkak's work called Egypt's Lost Cities, okay? And, and that aired uh, like late May 2011. Um, okay, so they talk about Akhenaten, Azahi Hawass. Uh, but looking, when, when you look at this, what happens is they, they use uh, infrared. It's a satellite that uses infrared technology to see underground. And because I read other articles dealing with this discovery. And they found 17 pyramids buried underneath Egypt. OK, so you have civilizations on top of civilizations. But they found 17 pyramids buried underneath Egypt as well as some other things. So this is just an example. You can research that. All right, let's go back to the um, go back to the slideshow for just a second here. So these are some of the topics that we do within the online course: ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, this is a nine-week online course. We do with thousands, thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, class starts Saturday. May 1st, 2021, 12 noon to 3 p.m. 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to post a link here. You can register uh, for the online course. It's nine weeks. We, uh, you can watch from around the world. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. As soon as you uh, register, you can start watching the content from the class that just ended. OK, I just finished doing a 10 week class uh, so you can watch that content and the class is regularly one hundred thirty dollars is on sale eight, on sale. Eighty dollars. We do a PowerPoint presentation, have book references, articles, everything. So it's a ton of information that you're going to get. Uh, let's go back to this here. And then also you can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the information at our, our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com also. OK. Um, let's continue here. So uh, another thing that we talk about is the uh, the Druids. OK, and this ties into ancient Africa and this also ties into the um, uh, St. Patrick. The British slave named Patrick, St. Patrick and. St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. But when we look at the Druids, Druid means he who knows in old Irish. OK. And the Druids were studying something called the Gnosis, which means the true knowledge. And they, they get their knowledge from ancient Kemet. They're dealing with a watered down version of teachings coming from ancient Egypt. OK. From ancient Kemet, now Valley region of Africa. If you read Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder, pages 193 and 194, and we use Browder's book in the class also. He talks some about the Druids, all right? And um, Pope Celestine I in 432 AD sends a British slave named Patrick into Ireland to convert the Irish to Christianity, okay? 
Now, at this at this point in time, at 432 A.D., fifth century A.D., the Catholic Church does not exist. You have the Eastern Orthodox Church at this point in time. Catholic Church does not exist. Catholic Church is going to come into existence in mid 11th century A.D. So I know when, I know people talk about the First Council of Nicaea, 325 A.D. And they talk about the Catholic Church. Catholic Church doesn't exist in 325 A.D. You're dealing with the Eastern Orthodox Church. Okay. Um, that's why you have to, you want to really deal with the timelines and understand this chronology of history. But the uh, Druids are dealing with a watered down version of teachings coming from ancient Kemet that are in conflict with Christianity. And Pope Celestine I is sending uh, Patrick in to Ireland to convert the Irish to Christianity. And uh, Patrick and his army, they killed thousands of Druids um, and forced Christianity on the Irish. Okay. He's also credited with introducing the Latin alphabet into Ireland as well. Uh, now, Christianity was already in uh, Ireland because it was uh, another person who was a bishop, I think, who went into Ireland like a year before. Uh, but so, but he gets credited with uh, converting a lot of the Irish to Christianity. Okay. And then the term frigatrisca decophobia, that, deal, that deals with a fear of Friday the 13th, frigatrisca decophobia. And Frigga or Freya or Freya was the wife of Odin in Nordic mythology, and Odin was the father of Thor. So when you study the origins of the days of the week, the names of the days of the week, a lot of that ties into Scandinavian mythology. Uh, Wednesday was Wooden's Day or Odin's Day. Thursday was Thor's Day. Friday is named after Freya or Freya or Frigga, depending upon which European language you're talking about. Uh, but if uh, Freya or Frigga is the wife of uh, Odin, and this is where Friday comes from, the, the word Friday comes from Frigga. So Frigga Triska decophobia means the Fear of Friday the 13th. Okay. So, like, this discovery here, this deals with the lost city, another lost city of Egypt that was swallowed into the sea around 12,000 years ago. This is an article from news.yahoo.com. Sunken Egyptian city reveals 1,200-year-old uh, secrets. This deals with Thomas Heraklion, the lost city of Egypt. These, this is what they found, some of the artifacts that they found. This deals with the 3,000-year-old uh, lost golden lost city of Egypt that was just discovered, uh, lost golden city. Okay, this article is from face2faceafrica.com, uh, April 9th, 2021. Um, a look at the 3,000 year old lost golden city that has just been discovered in Egypt. Okay, so so we'll deal with archaeological discoveries. Um, and then we'll, we'll look at, you know, when we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, the four main things that I talk about, we look at the human capital taken out of Africa, but it was more than just human capital that was taken out of Africa. There was also the, the Africans had intellectual capital. Okay. We were we were physicians, we were doctors, we were lawyers, we we, we were teachers, we were working with agriculture, we we're working with animals, um, you know, we're blacksmiths, we're uh working in the skilled trades. Uh you, you we have all different types of skill sets, we're engineers. Um, and this intellectual capital. Is going to create a massive brain drain on Africa as well. And it's going to benefit the, the quote unquote new world that they're being taken to. We talk about the natural resources, mineral wealth extracted, extracted out of Africa and also the technology taken out of Africa as well. 
the ways of doing things, the technology taken out of Africa also. Uh, this is Dr. John Henry Clark. Dr. John Henry Clark said all history is a current event. Everything that's ever happened continues to happen in some shape, form, or fashion. Dr. Wade Nobles, um, psychologist, he said, power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. Power coming from the Latin word poter, meaning to be able. Uh, and when we deal with this history, it's important to understand what African people lost or what has been greatly suppressed. Um, it's not just the history, it's African culture. Okay, culture deals with your traditions, your spiritual systems, your art, your music, your dance, your folklore, mythology, cosmology. Cosmology deals with understanding the universe as an orderly system, which comes out of a cultural paradigm. It deals with your language, your educational system. It deals with your cosmology, cos uh, your cosmogony. You have cosmo cosmology and cosmogony. Cosmogony deals with Understanding the universe, understanding the origins of the universe from your cultural paradigm also. Now, culture acts as an immune system, which keeps foreign elements from coming in and attacking you, as Dr. Um, Marine Ba'ani, who wrote Yorugu, an African-centered critique of European cultural thought and behavior, correctly teaches us. Culture is the glue or cohesiveness that binds a people together and tells them the only way that they will survive is through self-reliance and working together. Um, and this is why the number one employer of every ethnic group in America are their own people, except for African Americans. Now, this doesn't mean that they don't have government help. They all have they they all have help from the government. Okay, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, palm resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties. The adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. They all have some type of help from the government. All right, but they use their history and culture to fight for scarce scarce wealth, power, and resources. And the people's history and culture and their language, they help, this helps bind them together, okay? This helps draw them together. So we've largely been stripped of all of that because of the enslavement process. All right, let's continue. So we'll talk about, we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors and talk about the Moors losing control of their last stronghold, uh, Granada in Spain, January 2nd, 1492. And this is this right here is like really, really critical. Um, when we look at Egypt of the West and we deal with Freemasonry and we deal with th these teachings coming to this land that we call the United States of America. OK, I'm not um, I'm not talking about tens of thousands of years ago, but we're talking in the 1600s. So when we look at the Washington Monument, the Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol called a Tekken, an ancient African symbol called a Tekken. And uh, we see the Tekken in ancient Kemet, and there's still a few there today in Egypt, there's about 12 of them or so in Egypt. But it was a symbol of resurrection coming from the story of Asar or Seton Heru. OK, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis and Horus. All right. How's everybody doing? How you all like this type of information? Uh, when we look at Freemasonry, OK. And I reference Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. That's another book that we use in the class. E e Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. And. I don't know where my copy of the book is. It's around here somewhere. I'm seeing every other book right now. Hold on, where's Egypt on the Potomac? But I've got it. I've got it here. Um, got now about the contributions of civilization. Oh, here it is, right here. Uh, Egypt on the Potomac. You've got How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney. Crucial book. Okay, we don't talk about this one in the class. I don't think we're going to talk about this one in the class this time around. There's so much information already to cover. But Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Okay. 
Um, so if we look at Freemasonry, and we look at pages 18 and 32, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and son, the Latin words mass and son. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, okay? Uh, which symbolizes knowledge, okay? So throughout history, um, light was a, uh, a metaphor for knowledge, okay? And darkness was a metaphor for ignorance, right? Now the term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had identified 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were molded, oh, sorry, many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. In a series of steps or degrees. So when you go to a institution of higher learning or a liberal arts liberal arts college and you get your credentials you get your credentials in a series of degrees okay bachelor's degree so associate's degree bachelor's degree master's degree phd etc okay this is where this concept comes from then when you read um and i just saw the book okay um by uh, George GM, uh, Stolen Legacy by George GM James. He talks about the, uh, the, the seven liberal arts. And he talks about the trivium and the quadrivium. Okay, and he talks about the rhetoric and the logic and things like this, the seven liberal arts. All this goes back to the Nile Valley region of Africa. This is where all this comes from. So 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. 13 of the 39 signers of the U.S. Constitution were Freemasons. Four of the first five presidents were Freemasons as well. You read page 18 of Egypt on the Potomac, Browder breaks this down. But they're dealing with a watered down version, once again, of teachings coming from ancient Kemet. But what happens is, the Moors are taking these teachings into Europe. And you're going to have uh, a group that's going to be known as the Knights Templar that are going to be formed in 1118 AD during the Second Crusades. 1118 AD, the, the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar are, are studying the teachings from the Moors, these Africans. They're studying these teachings because when the Moors go in into Europe, 85, 90% of Europeans are illiterate. And these teachings are going to bring Europe out of the dark ages. The next stage that Europe is going to go, to, go into into the early 1500s is, is called the Renaissance era. The Renaissance era. And the Renaissance era means a, it, it deals with the era of enlightenment. Light. L-I-G-H-T. Enlightenment. They're coming out of the dark ages. Darkness meaning ignorance. And they're going into the Renaissance age of enlightenment, light meaning knowledge. Okay, let's continue here. So uh, this is a deep history. So this, we go through, take you through this history, deal with this chronologically, leading up to the transatlantic slave trade. So here's a famous statue of, now what I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness just because you never heard it before, disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about, okay? So here is the first holy trinity of Asara, Oset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Even when you look at Notre Dame, you know, a few years ago when the Notre Dame Cathedral caught fire, they were talking about some of the history of Notre Dame and, and Browder talks about this in, in um, now Valley contributions to civilization. Okay. But if you research Notre Dame cathedral, 
you'll find that Notre Dame was built on the remains of uh, two temples. Okay, one of those temples was was dedicated to Isis. Isis is what the is who the Greeks called Aset. So you're going to see the this mythology, and you're going to see this history hitting different cultures, different groups of people, different cultures, and influencing different groups of people. So one of the things I like to talk about is um, uh, in you have uh, the secrets of Isis, the secrets of Isis. Um, you, you have the uh, live action uh, show came on Saturday morning called The Secrets of Isis. And the secrets of Isis uh, was the superhero Isis from DC Comics. And when you watch the show, and I saw it a few years ago on Hulu, when you watch the show, it talked about how Isis got her powers from ancient Egypt. And they talk about the daughters of Hathor and all this stuff. You watch the beginning of it, man. They, they talk about all, all this ancient Egyptian stuff in the TV show. Now, watching it in the 70s, I used to watch this show in the 70s when it came on. It, it, it used to be the Shazam and Isis Hour. The Shazam and Isis Hour on Saturday mornings, CBS, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Shazam and Isis Hour. I still have comic books from like the 70s that in the comic books, they would advertise all these shows for Saturday morning. This before we didn't have the comedy. We didn't, we, 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 we didn't have like the cartoon channel, all that stuff. We didn't have that. Okay. So Saturday morning, that's when all the cartoons came on, okay? And all the new cartoons, Super Friends and, you know, you know all, all, all the cartoons that we watched back then. Uh, Mighty Mouse or whatever the hell it was, right? So the Shazam and Isis Hour was a live action show. And they had this white woman whose name, who, who was Isis, and she had all these superpowers. But at the time, we didn't know that she was a copy of an African woman out of African, uh, out of, you know, ancient, Kem ancient Kemetic mythology. This is where they were getting it from. And we're sitting there mesmerized and you got this, you know, have, you know, attractive white woman doing all this supernatural stuff. And, they were getting it from our culture. So from the, the statue that you see here, this is all set with the baby Heru. Okay. And Heru was born of a virgin birth on December 25th to the virgin all set. And from the story of our all set and Heru, you get, the black Madonna and child, which Europeans are worshiping for hundreds of years throughout Europe. And you still have, you still have statues of the black Madonna and child right now in like Poland and in Italy and, and uh, Czechoslovakia and Russia. They were, wor they were worshiping African people. Then, then you have to wonder what the hell happened. They, you know, to be, to be honest with you, if we look at how African-American women are treated today, especially in negative corporate control hip hop, I mean, hundreds of years ago, Europeans, they were idolizing African people. Hundreds, hundreds of years ago, when, you know, when you have the worship of the black Madonna and child, things like this, I mean, Europeans were idolizing African people. You have to ask what happened. Then you get the decolorized version, okay? Because, see, as Europeans are coming out of the Dark Ages, 
And as you have a rise in European powers and they're conquering people's land and you have a rise in European powers, then you have a um, you have a a um, a rise in the European phenotype. As you go into the as you go into the early 1500s, things like this, you have a rise in the European phenotype. And. What's going to take place is a lot of these different. Um, traditional figures and mythological characters, etc. A lot of these are going to be reinterpreted as European figures. So Hercules was African. Hercules gets reinterpreted as European. Uh, you had the Black Madonna and Child. Okay. And this gets reinterpreted as European. Um, you, you have, uh, Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. Okay. Uh, in the early 1500s and he, he uses his, uh, relatives as the, uh, model for Adam and Eve. Okay. And he uses, and he, he, he um, depicts, uh, God as being a European. Okay, so you go. What happens is, is you have a rise in the European powers coming out of the Dark Ages. You're going to have a rise in the European phenotype. Okay, so let's uh, let's continue. So we're going to wrap this up. So we do a why December twenty fifth. Why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th? Because nowhere now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before or disagree with it does not mean it's not true. Just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. Nowhere in the biblical text does it mention the celebration of Christmas. Nowhere in the biblical text does it mention that Jesus the Christ was born on December 25th. And also the letter J wasn't created till the year 1630 AD. So um, when you look at the word Jesus in the dictionary, it takes you back to uh, Yeshua, which is Hebrew, because the letter J is derived from the letter I and the letter J didn't exist in, um, you know, first, second century A.D. The letter J didn't exist. But and, and also the celebration of Christmas didn't exist either. The, and the, the word Christmas that comes into existence in about mid 11th century A.D. also. OK, so one one of the mistakes that's oftentimes made is that um, a lot of times people think the way that we do things today is how pe we've always done it. Even when you even when you study Christianity, right, early Christianity looked a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. Early Christianity is different. It was a lot different than the way people celebrate Christianity today, because the, the, the way people celebrate Christianity today, a lot of that. Um, is shaped by those 21 ecumenical councils held between 325 AD to 1870, the first council of Nicaea, council of Chalcedon, uh, council of Constantinople, um, council of Ephesus, things like this. And they're going to shape what people believe, how they practice Christianity. Uh, they're going to shape what's uh, the books taken out of the Bible, the books left in the Bible. OK, so that's going to evolve over a course of hundreds of years. OK, so we'll deal with we deal with uh, why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th. This ties into all this history and astronomy and the winter solstice and ancient Kemet, you know, ancient Africa, things like this. Um, so we do a ton of history in this class. All right. This is Dr. Carter G. Woodson as well, who wrote The Miseducation of the Negro and uh, co-founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, September 9th, 1915, creative Negro History Week in 1926, okay, which became Black History Month in 1976 and is now African American History Month. All right, so this is just a um, brief overview of the 
nine week 18 hour online course that i teach called ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school okay um we know that dr francis Cress wilson and nilly fuller correctly taught us if you do not understand european white supremacy and racism what it is and how it works everything else that you think that you understand will totally confuse you everything else that you think that you understand will totally confuse you and I have, um, I knew Dr. Welsing. I interviewed uh, my sister three times on my radio show. So, that, I mean, that was a brilliant sister right there. Uh, and then here's a famous book, The Isis Papers, The Keys to the Colors. One of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, uh, and uh, my other teacher, Professor Jane Small. Okay, they're good friends. But Dr. J and Professor James Small, when they teach, they talk about the pyramid principle. And here we see uh, Herr M. Aket or the, or the Sphinx in the uh, Pyramid of Khafre um, at, at Giza. And they talk about the pyramid principle. So a pyramid has three sides and the foundation is African history and culture. Okay, this gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. African history and culture gives us our VIPs, our values, our interests, and our principles. This gives us a cultural paradigm that we see reality through. And our values, our interests, and our principles, this influences two sides of the pyramid, economic empowerment and political empowerment. Okay? So this is why this information is so important. This, in, this influences our economic empowerment, how we engage in economics and influences our political empowerment and our understanding of politics and understanding that politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power and resources and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties that adopts an interpretation and enforcement. We have to have a synthesis of all three of these, it's not just African history and culture. It's understanding the economic empowerment, especially the, co the concept of the cooperatives and cooperative economics. OK, so we have to have a synthesis of all three of these. And Dr. Leonard Jeffries uh, correctly teaches us whoever controls the images controls your uh, self-esteem, your self-respect and self-development. Whoever controls the history controls the vision. All right. So that is a. Um, that's just a brief overview. Of some of the information that we cover in the online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so this is a nine-week, 18-hour online course that I teach. Uh, we do the class live. It's going to be on Saturdays. Uh, it starts May 1st, 2021, 12 noon, to three, uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we posted the link here, but when you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the home page, it has the information for the uh, online class. And you scroll down, it has the information for my radio show. I'm on Sundays, 9 p.m. Well, I'm on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight, Eastern Standard Time, and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation WFDF in Detroit. We also broadcast on our Facebook fan page. The African History Network and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. You can click here to listen to audio podcasts on my shows. Click here to read articles. This is the uh, episode of my show from uh, March 15, 2021, the day after the Grammys. I talked about Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B performing WAP and negative corporate controlled hip hop. We have information for the online course here. We have a flyer here about it uh, as well. Click on register here. It takes you to the next page. Click right here to enroll. Class is regularly $130. It's on sale $80. As soon as you register, you can start watching the content. You can start, watch the class um, that uh, just ended about a week or so ago. Uh, you can watch that, and then you'll be ready for uh, class starting up Saturday, uh, May 1st, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. Once again, the, we do the classes live. You can ask questions during the class. We have live text chat. Uh, we do the classes, classes live. But all the sessions are recorded, so you go back and watch them over and over again, okay? Um, you want to, uh, the, if you have a, like an advanced cell phone, you may be able to watch the class on cell phone, on, on your cell phone, on your smartphone. 
Um, usually a computer or tablet is better. Some people have a more advanced phone. You may have an iPhone or something like that. You, you can watch. Um, but the browser that works best is Google Chrome. Google Chrome is the browser that works best to view the class also. Okay, just so people know. All right. So you can register for our online course. Be sure to listen to uh, my uh, watch my show Monday through Friday and on Sundays. And uh, follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. Turn on live, turn on live notifications so you know uh, when we go live. OK. Also, if you like this type of information, you want to support the African History Network. Um, you can support us dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And then all my DVD lectures are available at our website, digital downloads, all that's at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay. All right. Well, look, hopefully you like this type of information. Um, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, remember, right now it's correct for wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. <laughs>